Uh, this is Dimitrios Tatsis to speak with us about Qualcomm's applications DSP. Thank you. So, hi everyone. My name is Dimitrios, and today I'm going to be talking about Qualcomm's uh, Hexagon and ADSP. You can find me on Twitter at uh, Detached. I'm a security researcher at Census uh, SA in Greece. Uh, in my day job, I do reverse engineering, exploitation, code audits, and all that stuff. And for the past years, my main focus is on Android devices, pretty much anything uh, on the Android stack. So uh, a little background for this talk. Uh, I was looking for uh, some uh, attack vectors to the Android kernel, and then I found this uh, uh, strange ADSP driver. And uh, uh, basically, this just started my whole uh, journey into the ADSP and the Qualcomm Hexagon. Uh, so please join me in this uh, journey into uh, exotic architecture, uh, weird uh, uh, system programming, and uh, all that stuff. Okay, so our agenda for today, uh, first we're going to have a brief introduction to the ADSP and Hexagon. Then we're going to take a look into the system architecture. Um, next, we're going to look uh, uh, in detail the Fast RPC framework, which is basically the communication between the ADSP processor and the rest of the system. Uh, we're gonna, then we're going to look how to run our uh, own custom code on the ADSP. We're going to take a look at the attack surface that is exposed by ADSP and some security considerations around it. And then we're going to take a look at uh, the fuzzing campaign that we did on the ADSP and finally some conclusions. Okay, so ADSP and Hexagon. ADSP is basically a coprocessor that is present on many, uh, on most modern Qualcomm chipsets. It's a low power, high performance uh, processor used for uh, DSP applications. And it's uh, built on the Hexagon architecture, which is the same as uh, the Qualcomm baseband. So uh, it's a separate coprocessor that uh, runs its own uh, separate operating system called CURT. Qualcomm real-time operating system. It runs hexagon files, and it's again, it's the same uh, as the Qualcomm uh, baseband. And the main functionality of the ADSP is that it provides shared objects that can be called by the uh, Android user space. So we can call uh, functions in the ADSP space uh, from, a from a normal Android application, basically. And uh, these functions usually correspond to machine learning, audio, video decoding, speech recognition, and uh, all that stuff. So the ADSP uh, communicates with the rest of the system with something called a uh, shared memory subsystem of Qualcomm. And it's also used uh, for uh, baseband and uh, Wi-Fi communication. Um, so basically, ADSP needs to have access to the main system memory in order to, in, in order to read uh, the past arguments and write the results back to the user. So this is a diagram from uh, the Qualcomm documentation. As you can see, the hexagon processor is able to read uh, and is able to access uh, the main system memory, but only through a memory protection unit. So basically, the memory protection unit limits what uh, memory the ADSP can or can't access. And there's also an MMU, a memory management unit that is managed by the real-time operating system, which provides translation from virtual addresses to physical addresses. And what's interesting is that the documentation states that there are limited TLB entries, so large contiguous buffers are preferred. And there are two main mechanisms for that. The first one is the memory carve-out system, which is built on top of the Android ion allocator. So the ion allocator is a, is a special allocator uh, on Android that provides contiguous buffers in physical memory. Uh, there is a specific ion heap, uh, specifically for uh, usage from the ADSP. And finally, ion buffers can be mapped to the ADSP. There's also a system memory management unit, or an SMMU. This is uh, pretty much analogous to the IOMMU in x86. And it provides another level of translation. So uh, memory buffers appear to be contiguous, but they're not in, in reality. So if you think about the hexagon architecture, uh, it's specifically designed for DSP use cases. It's a very long instruction word, 32-bit uh, instruction set. 
It's lint to Indian and it provides four execution units. So basically you can think of it as four cores that run instructions in parallel with something called instruction packets that we're going to have a, br a brief look uh, next. So the architecture uh, has uh, general purpose registers, R0 to R31. The last three registers are the stack pointer, frame pointer, and the link register. And it provides special hardware synchronization primitives in order um, to synchronize uh, the four execution units. And its assembly language is uh, it's not really typical to x86 or, or ARM. Um, this is the stack layout uh, for a hexagon. It's uh, pretty much uh, si it's pretty similar to other architectures. You save the link register in the stack, the frame pointer, and then you have the local variables of the function. And of course, the stack goes from high addresses, higher addresses to to lower addresses. Okay, so this is an example of a hexagon assembly. Um, inside the braces, you see uh, you can have up to four instructions, and this is an instruction packet. So. Uh, these four instructions are executed in parallel. So in the last line, you see that there is a, a comparison with the peer zero, the result uh, saved in P0. And then uh, if, if P0 is, is true, so it's basically like the zero flag in x86, uh, there's a jump. So this P0 new actually synchronizes the execution threads because these two instructions are going to be executed in parallel, but now the one execution uh, unit is waiting for the result for P0 from the other one. Okay, so Hexagon has a few hardware security mitigations uh, present in Hexagon version uh, 61 and later. Uh, there's, a, there's a frame limit register that actually, uh, that when uh, there's a new uh, stack, uh, there's a new uh, call to a function, in the frame, a stack frame allocation, if the stack pointer is less than the frame limit register, then an exception is thrown. So basically, this is like a mitigation uh, in case you have a remote code execution and you want to call an arbitrary function. Um, and there's also a frame key register, which holds a key that is XORed with uh, the program counter that is saved uh, on the stack for the turn address. And the documentation states that it's uh, different for every uh, hardware thread, and it changes r regularly, but no really other information is provided. Okay, so a few things about CURT. It's Qualcomm's real-time operating system. It runs on the ADSP and baseband, and it has three privilege modes. Uh, the CURT OS mode, which basically has all the privileges. Uh, the guest OS mode, which is basically, basically like a root user in, uh, in Unix systems. And it's also the user privilege mode. And as an operating system, it provides scheduling, resource management, address translation, and pretty much uh, typical uh, OS stuff. So Kurt uh, does not employ ASLR. Uh, it uses stack cookies, uh, and it also um, has a form of uh, write XOR execute. So you can write to executable memory, and you get execute. Uh, data memory, and it also has a form of uh, heap corruption protection, so it's not it's not all that bad. And the curt binary can be found under slash firmware slash image, uh, which is the folder that uh, elf binary uh, with a unified translate uh, utility from Benjamin Gao. Okay, so now I'm gonna take a deep dive into the faster PC framework, which is the communication between uh, the ADSP and the rest of the system. Uh, it, it is built on top, of the, on top of Qualcomm's shared memory subsystem, but I'm not going to touch that uh, in this talk. Uh, and it has uh, some intermediate libraries on the Android user space side. It has uh, something called stub libraries, and on the ADSP side, uh, it has uh, the so-called scale libraries. And there's also a kernel driver uh, on the Android kernel that is responsible for this communication. So this is another diagram from Qualcomm uh, documentation. Unfortunately, the reality is a bit more complicated than that. This is a simplified version, but we're going to take a, a look into each step of the way. So first, let's assume that we have an Android application and we want to use the ADSP for, for some calculations. Um, just a side note here. Uh, all of this talk, uh, 
in this talk I'm going to talk about Android, but basically it's going to be pretty much the same on Windows and ARM because there are uh, Windows devices that have Snapdragon Qualcomm processors, so I'm, I'm guessing it's pretty similar. So uh, let's say you have an Android application, and what functions and libraries can we use? Uh, can we call from uh, the ADSP? So all the uh, first RPC uh, has something called the remote file system, which is under a slash vendor lib RFSA ADSP, and it basically holds all the libraries that are accessible from uh, user space. Um, and all these libraries vary from vendor to vendor, so you're going to find different libraries on a Samsung device and different uh, and different set of libraries on a Google Pixel, for example. So this is an example of some libraries. You see uh, library names like face recognition, object segmentation, text recognition, and uh, there's also stuff for audio and video decoding that we talked earlier. So basically, for every library, there is a corresponding scale library uh, that is responsible for unmarshalling the parameters and calling the actual uh, function implementation. And um, Qualcomm provides a library called libADSPRPC. So basically, with a library name, we can get a remote handle with the function remote handle open. And then with this handle, we can actually use the function remote handle invoke. Invoke takes three arguments. The first one is the handle that we got uh, from remote handle open. Then we have an, an integer which, uh, which is called SC, and uh, it uh, describes uh, basically the arguments that we're going to send to uh, ADSP. So it has the number of input buffers, output buffers, uh, input and output handles, and also the method index. So this is the index that corresponds to the function that we want to call from a specific library on the ADSP. And finally, we have the actual uh, remote argument, uh, which is a pointer, um, which, uh, which holds an array of pointers and uh, the corresponding lengths to those pointers that uh, uh, are our input and output buffers that uh, are going to be used by the remote library. So this is uh, an example uh, of a remote handle invoke. So let's say we got a handle from remote handle open, we want to call a method with index 0x11, and we have two input arguments and one output argument. And uh, note here that at the remote arguments pointer, you first have to, you first must have the input arguments, and then you must have the output arguments. Okay, so pretty much any of this is pretty transparent to an Android application because uh, Usually there are so-called stub libraries that are already generated for the libraries in the ADSP. And these are responsible for finally calling remote handle open and invoke using, of course, libADSP RPC. And in the end, remote handle open and invoke uh, are actually IOCTL wrappers. So now we go to the kernel driver. So the kernel driver exposes a virtual device under slash dev ADSP RPC SMD. Uh, unfortunately, on l uh, latest devices, uh, this virtual device is protected by SLinux Linux permissions, so specific applications are only allowed to, to access this device. And it exposes an IOCTL interface to the user space. So these are some uh, IOCTL commands that we can send. We see IOCTL init, IOCTL in invoke, IOCTL mmap, Invoke FD and set mode, and there are a few others, I think, on the latest uh, the latest Linux uh, Linux kernel. So we're going to have a look at IOCTL init, which is basically used in order to load a hexagonal binary uh, on the ADSP. So basically, we just read a hexagonal binary and we copy the raw ELF data into an ion buffer, and then on that on that IOCTL, we pass the ion pointer and the ion file descriptor to this ELF. And what's also interesting is that uh, there's also a memory argument that is passed to this ISTL, and from the naming scheme, I understand that this is used for the working memory of this uh, specific executable, which is really interesting. So uh, libadsp RPC uh, does a fast RPC ICL in it, uh, loading slash DSP slash fast RPC shell zero. Uh, there are a number of other hexagon binaries under that uh, under that folder slash DSP. 
So fast RPC shell is a hexagon elf executable and is basically responsible for loading the scale library in the actual implementation library. It basically just delegates execution to, to those libraries. But it also provides, a few, uh, it provides some functionality of its own. Uh, basically it provides ADSPPS, which is, as you can imagine, a PS uh, utility for the ADSP. Where with this, we can actually see which processes run on the ADSP currently and some other functionality as well. So back to remote handle open. Uh, remote handle open calls uh, the IOCTL init uh, IOCTL in order to load FastRPC shell zero. And then there is an IOCTL invoke, which actually invokes a function remotely on the ADSP, but with a hard-coded hard hard handle. So basically, remote handle invoke from libADSP RPC is a very thin wrapper for uh, IOCTL invoke, it takes exactly the same arguments. It takes a handle, an SC value, and a remote arguments pointer. And basically uh, does the actual call uh, to the ADSP of the remote function that we want. So during uh, remote handle open, the IOCTL invoke is called with a handle uh, equals one. So this apparently is some sort of handle for system functions and with a specific method index, uh, we get a valid handle for the library that we want to call on the ADSP. Actually, all IOCTLs lead to code, uh, lead to IOCTL invoke code with handle equals one and different method indexes. So for, exa for example, the MMAP, IOCTL MMAP that we saw earlier and a few other stuff. Finally, we assume that we have a valid uh, library handle and now we can use remote handle invoke in order to invoke a function on the ADSP. And this is done uh, with the Qualcomm shared memory subsystem. Uh, but the question is, how are arguments actually passed to the ADSP? So if you look at, if you look at the kernel code for IOCTL invoke, um, there is code that is responsible uh, for doing an SCM call to trust zone. So basically, when you pass the remote arguments pointers, to this IOCTL uh, after this chain of functions like FastRPC buffer lock, hypervisor assigned physical, hypervisor and assigned table or something similar, I guess. There is an actual call to trust zone. So we're now in trust zone. Trust zone is apparently responsible for uh, managing the memory protection unit and the SMMU page table entries. So basically the ADSP cannot uh, have access to uh, specific memory unless Trust zone uh, explicitly allows that. So finally, we're now in the ADSP space. Uh, Kurt passes execution to FastRPC shell and for that specific library handle that we opened earlier, uh, the scale library is loaded. So the scale library, as we said, is responsible for unmarshalling the, ar the past arguments and uh, depending on the method index, the actual function implementation uh, is called. And then uh, after DSP uh, finishes uh, computing, it passes the results all the way back to the Android user space. So now you have a pretty good idea how FastRPC works, but there are still a few missing pieces, like how does Trust Zone actually maps memory to the ADSP? How does curt work and how does delegate execution to uh, libraries and fast RPC shell? And also in our tests, we saw some calls to uh, remote handle invoke, but with handle uh, equals three. Um, but these were not really necessary for our tests, so I'm not really sure what, what this is about. Okay, so now we're going to run custom code on the ADSP. So uh, Qualcomm provides something called a hexagon SDK, which is based on LLVM and provides a full tool chain uh, for a hexagon and ADSP. It, it, it includes a compiler, uh, linker, a readelf, OBJ dump, even a simulator uh, uh, included uh, wi with an LLDB included, which is uh, f pretty pretty nice. There are also a few utilities like. Uh, an ADSPPS precompiled binary that you can use in order to show pr uh, processes running on the ADSP and some relevant documentation. 
So we would like to run our own custom code on the ADSP. And uh, of course, we need to put our own libra libraries uh, on the remote file system. The first minor handle, uh, hurdle is, of course, that remote file system is read-only. So we d simply have to get root and remote the partition to be writable. But the actual obstacle is that the remote libraries must be signed with Qualcomm keys. And um, I guess there could be a way to bypass the sign check. I haven't really looked into it. Uh, I don't know if Trust Zone is involved uh, as the other sign checks uh, that happen on Android, a typical Android system. But what it did is uh, I got a development board. So I got a development board uh, from a company called Intrinsic, the OpenQ820 development board, which is an ARM development board. Uh, it has a Snapdragon 820, which is basically the same as the uh, chipset in uh, Google Pixel, the original Google Pixel. Um, it, it, it exposes uh, JDAG pins for debugging, and the debug fuse is enabled. So basically, Fuses are kind of a special memory only accessible from Trust Zone or the secure world. And uh, the debug fuse is uh, disabled on, um, on production devices, but it's not disabled on this development board. So this is basically what enables us to run custom libraries on the ADSP. So in order to do that, we have to create something called the testsig.so and uh, upload that to the remote file system. Uh, this shared object can be uh, generated by the hexagon SDK utilities. We just need the device serial number in order to, to generate that. And after that, we can just run our own code on the development board on the ADSP. So hexagon SDK provides a number of examples for uh, ADSP code. Uh, we'll take the, uh, the simplest example uh, called calculator, which just does a, does a number of uh, simple math operations on the ADSP. And uh, in order to build that, it, it has some custom make files and a Python build script that does pretty much anything, including the generation of the stable libraries that are on the Android side and the scale libraries that are on, on the ADSP side. So we just played around with it, and this is what, we what I did, basically. Um, I just changed change the remote function that we call in order to return to the user the value of the pointer. So when, you, when I run the executable from the Android user space, I get this return value of 55 CF38, which basically corresponds to the virtual address that the ADSP, uh, the ADSP uses, which is uh, pretty nice. Um, I guess this, uh, this uh, can also be used in order to poke around the system, like examine the memory layout, examine uh, the security mitigations, if they're really in place, and also poke around the real-time operating system uh, API. Um, okay, so it would be great if you had hardware debugging uh, on the development board. So there's a, there's a debug board called Louderback32, which supports Hexagon and ADSP and can be used for hardware debugging. Unfortunately, the cost is somewhat prohibitive for a side project. Um, and I tried to, do, uh, to replicate that with uh, OpenOCD and uh, Bus Blaster uh, on with the JTAG, but I didn't really have uh, any luck. But again, I'm not really the hardware type besides my uh, electrical engineering degree. So I guess some of you will have uh, much better success with that. And there are some Lauterbach 32 scripts uh, online that include some offsets, some bus offsets that I guess could be really useful for that, um, for hardware debugging. So software debugging, uh, Hexagon documentation states that uh, software debugging is, uh, is supported on MSM8998 development boards. Unfortunately, I only had an MSM8996 development board, so I couldn't really use that. Um, Qualcomm also provides a di the Diag interface, which is also used for on baseband and Wi-Fi research for diagnostic messages and uh, debugging. And also, there was a very interesting talk uh, last year, I think, uh, called Exploring Qualcomm Baseband via Modkit, which basically they inject their own debugger on the baseband side. So remember that the baseband actually has the same architecture as the ADSP and actually has the same operating system. So my guess is that work from that presentation would be really 
straightforward to transfer to the ADSP in order to get a proper debugging uh, environment. Okay, so gonna take a look at the attack surface that is exposed. Basically, ADSP exposes the SAB libraries responsible for marshalling, kernel driver, and on the ADSP side, we have the scale libraries responsible for the unmarshalling, and also the actual implementation libraries. So, a possible attack scenario is uh, something like an attacker could send data that would eventually be processed by code on the ADSP. So audio or video data that are going to be decoded uh, in a browser or a messenger or something very similar to that. And uh, an attack could be performed on the marshalling or the unmarshalling libraries and the implementation libraries that are on the ADSP. Also, locally, an attacker could also um, perform an attack on the local, uh, basically, Linux kernel driver, but this is not really our focus uh, for this talk. So, on the ADSP, as we said, there are, there's, a, there's a large number of libraries that are exposed. functions that are exposed like the ADSPPS uh, and a few others. So um, the question is, even after a successful exploitation, do we cross a security binary, a uh, security, security boundary? So let's say that we have a vulnerability on the ADSP side and we are now in CURT user space. So can we do something like CURT privilege escalation? Um, what is the actual communication between the ADSP and trust zone, which could also be exposed. Uh, I think, um, if you remember from earlier, there is the memory protection unit that basically limits what memory the ADSP uh, can read and write. Uh, so maybe that's more than enough. So maybe the ADSP can actually access uh, and overwrite, I don't know, shared memory, so, uh, shared memory structures, or eventually uh, data that are going to be parsed by an Android application or data that are going to be parsed by the Android kernel. So uh, that's not really uh, a blocker for all, uh, for all attacks. And in newer uh, SOCs, uh, there's also a CDSP uh, and the MDSP that, that's exposed. So basically CDSP is a compute DSP. It's, it's basically the same like ADSP, but for uh, compute purposes. And uh, the MDSP is the modem DSP. So basically, you, we can offload work to the basement processor just like the ADSP. So uh, the scenario is that you want to do something, some very crazy calculations that you uh, eventually need three hexagon cores with four execution units each, each. So the first one is ADSP, then CDSP, and then the MDSP. So I guess this actually exposes the attack, uh, it's another uh, attack uh, vector to the baseband from the user space, which is uh, really interesting. Okay, now we're gonna talk about uh, fuzzing. Um, FastCV is a uh, library provided by Qualcomm for computer vision. They provide implementations for uh, ARM, GPUs, and also Hexagon and it's present on many Qualcomm Android uh, devices. So FastCV exp uh, exposes uh, like uh, 500 uh, plus uh, functions doing matrix multiplication, calculating Hamming distances, uh, allocating data structures, etc. And this library is available on the ADSP th through the FastCV ADSP handle. So on the remote file system on the ADSP side, we have FastCV ADSP scale, and, uh, which is responsible for unmarshalling the parameters. And we also have the actual function implementation on FastCV ADSP. So we would like to analyze uh, the scale library in order to see how to effecti effectively FAS uh, FastCV. So in order to do that, we need a hexagon assembler. Uh, unfortunate, unfortunately, IDA Pro and Ghidra do not support uh, the Hexagon architecture natively. Uh, Hexagon SDK provides an OBJ dump for Hexagon, but unfortunately, it does not work for all binaries. Basically, for some binaries, it just returns immediately, and I, d I don't know why is that. 
So there's also a project called Hexagoon, uh, which is an IDA Pro plugin uh, that enables IDA to, to disassemble hexagon binaries. Um, the problem with Hexagoon is that some immediate operands are not decoded correctly. And I know this because I almost drove myself insane trying to uh, match a few offsets and I eventually decoded the instruction by hand and found that uh, the immediate operand the immediate operands uh, were wrong. Um, Radari 2 also supports uh, hexagon. Uh, in latest versions they also support instruction packets that they didn't support a few versions earlier. Um, there's a capstone internal build that is not public, unfortunately, that supposedly supports hexagon, but uh, it is stated that since the hexagon assembly is so different from the others, it's not really cohesive with the rest of the API or some, something similar. Um, and there's also a plugin uh, from GMSK for IDA Pro again. It has less issues than the others from my tests. The only, my only nitpick is that registered pairs, uh, uh, it's not really easy to find individual registers when registered pairs are used. So basically you can use registered pairs as a 64-bit uh, register. But it's really uh, a minor issue. So um, I guess most of you know Ghidra. Ghidra uh, supposedly uh, makes adding support for a new architecture easier than other tools with something called the Slay or the Processor Specification Language. And uh, it's really um, helpful that if you uh, define the instructions uh, in Ghidra's uh, language, then you also get a decompiler without running any parsing code, uh, which is a huge time saver. So I have implemented a few opcodes, but it's still, there's still a, a lo long way to go. So this is an example of uh, uh, m my uh, definitions for Ghidra, for Hexagon. First, we define uh, a 32-bit instruction. We define the bits for the I-class identifier, source destination registers, and then we have the low and high bits. Uh, this is for I the, ins the instruction that adds an immediate operand to a register. So basically, the low bits are saved uh, from bits 5 to 13, and then the high bits are, are from bits 21 to 27. So basically, we need to reconstruct the immediate value, and that's what we do. We just take the high, um, the high bits, shift by 9, and then we add the, the low bits. And inside the braces, uh, we actually model this instruction uh, in order to get the, the uh, decompiler uh, for, th for that instruction. So if you notice, there is a caret character uh, just before RD. Um, this denotes that RD is not the actual mnemonic of this instruction because that's what, Git, that's what uh, Gitra does by default. So my question to you that uh, have looked into Gitra more is how to set add as the mnemonic because I couldn't find it in the, in the documentation. So. And this is an example, uh, this is what we get from Ghidra with this definition. So we have an immediate value that is added to R0 and the result is saved on R2. Um, this is a actually a signed 16-bit uh, uh, value, but uh, I, I'm okay with that for now. And there's still a long way to go, but hopefully sometime in the future, Ghidra will have full hexagon support um, with not too much pain. So thanks NSA, I guess. So uh, we now take a look into the FastCV scale library uh, using the GMSK hexagon plugin for IDA. Every scale library has a function called scale invoke that gets the SC argument from remote handle invoke and also the remote arguments. So here in this code, um, you see that the function takes the method index, extracts the method index from the SC and also saves the remote arguments pointer to, to another register. So next, uh, some offsets are calculated, and in, this in the third line, uh, there's, um, the code compares the method index with 0x1f, and if it's more than 0x1f, basically the code ret uh, returns an error. So basically, the method index has to be less than, less than or equal 0x1f. And then, we have this basic block that basically um, uses the method index and shifts it by two in order to obtain uh, an offset from an offset table 
and then this offset is added to the program counter in order to continue execution to the, the code that is relevant for, for this method index for this specific function. Um, we'll just take a random example from, from, the the, from the offset table here. So this code is pretty much um, typical for any, any offset really. It's, it just takes uh, the input handles, the output handles, input buffers, output buffers, and it checks if the number of arguments is less than five. And if it is, then the, uh, the code returns an error again. And here, uh, the code actually checks that the length of the first input argument is actually more uh, or equal to uh, 14. And if it's less than 14, uh, again, it, it returns an error. So this is pretty much how the code goes for a few basic blocks. There are a few more uh, length checks, parameter and marshalling, arithmetic shifts. And finally, a few basic blocks later, we finally get a call to the actual fastcv function that we wanted to call from the beginning, the uh, beautifully named function fastcv adsp fcv cross product 3x 1f 32q. So, okay, so now we want to have all the pieces in order to do fuzzing on the fastcv. We know how to call uh, functions on the adsp with the first with the fast RPC protocol. Um, we analyze how fast CV expects its arguments, and there's a large number of uh, complex functions that are exposed, so we're just going to make the simplest fuzzer ever for fast CV. So it's pretty basic, really. You just get a remote handle f with remote handle open, and when with this handle, you just need to do a remote handle invoke with uh, using buffers with random data. Um, but the issue here is that we need to uh, be careful with the SC value that we're going to pass to remote handle invoke. Remember that this is the value that describes the number of input and output arguments, so you want to bypass the, uh, the argument, the length of the uh, arguments checks that are performed earlier. So um, I guess you could parse the fastcv header file and get the actual number of arguments that are, uh, are expected from each function, but a much better idea is just to get the stub libraries for fastcv that uh, exist on the Android user space side. So basically, every function we want to call on uh, the ADSP side has a corresponding stub function on the Android user space side. So uh, it does a remote handle invoke with the correct SC value, so that would be really helpful. In reality, though, we don't really need any of this because the scale library does not actually check if the uh, number of arguments is uh, more than what it expects it only fails if the number of arguments is less than, than it expects. So we just need to make sure that we pass a large number of arguments and we should be fine. And we saw earlier that uh, the code checks the method index with 0x1f, so basically we just need to uh, send a random method index but less than, less than or equal to 0x1f and just hope for the best. So this is our fuzzer in action. We get a remote handle and then we do remote handle invoke and we see a few invocations, but there is a point that remote handle invoke returns minus one, and after that point, uh, there is a constant return value of 0x27, and what's also interesting is that these, uh, uh, the functions would return immediately, like super fast. And after a bit of digging, we found that um, Kernel driver is responsible for setting up the SMMU for the AADSP, and it also sets up a fault handler for the SMMU. So basically, when the SMMU uh, faults, uh, the kernel callback is called, and the number of faults in the SMMU is increased. So apparently, there was a fault in the SMMU, and then the number 39 or 0x27 is returned. And uh, you can't actually call something on ADSP uh, unless you just uh, open the file again and start a new, a new session. So my guess is that there was a bug of some sort on FastCV, uh, but it was caught by the SMMU, so it's not really uh, clear if we could use that in order to obtain code execution on the ADSP, but this just needs more digging in. So we didn't really have any luck in FastCV, 
And now we're using the same, uh, the same fuzzer for the shrouded in mystery handle number one. So remember that the kernel was using uh, the handle number one in order to do some system specific functions like open a remote handle uh, uh, and some other stuff. So basically we just don't need to do a remote handle open, we just do a remote handle invoke with uh, handle equals one, just like the kernel. And our development board crashes almost immediately, and this is what we see on the kernel log, fatal error on ADSP, subsystem failure, exception detected. And our, de our development board, though, had a very old Android version, had Android 7, which is, uh, I don't know, three years old at this point. And we tested the same fuzzer on Pixel 3, on the latest firmware that has a, a Snapdragon 845, but we didn't get uh, any crashes, unfortunately. So more evaluation is needed on that. We need to analyze how Kurt works, ne uh, find the function handler for handle equals one, maybe use the hexagon simulator, uh, and also uh, a debug environment would, would, really, would really help uh, the evaluation of, of this crash. So some conclusions. The ADSP is a very interesting exploitation target. We can now fuzz libraries on the ADSP. You can now fuzz libraries on the ADSP, so I'm sure some of you will play with that. We can also uh, run our own code on the ADSP uh, using a development board, uh, which is uh, really interesting for further investigation. And there's a lot of research waiting to, to be done. Like it's a, it's a very interesting uh, architecture. And some future work, uh, a proper disassembler or decompiler would uh, greatly uh, enhance, our, uh, enhance our experience. Uh, the security boundary must be investigated like more like what can you do or what can you do uh, once you have code execution on the ADSP. And again, uh, debug environment would be re really helpful. Um, what's also interesting is that uh, Qualcomm is not, uh, is not alone, um, does not have, uh, is not the only one that has uh, specific uh, processors for specific tasks. So. There are other vendors like Apple's uh, neural engine that is used for machine learning acceleration. Um, Google has something called the Pixel Visual Core that is used for image processing uh, for the camera that is actually a RISC-V architecture, which is really interesting. Also, Huawei uh, employs a neural processing unit, again, for machine learning. And, of the, and all of this is really interesting for, uh, from a security perspective. So these are some uh, uh, this is some ref references to awesome re research. Uh, you should check that out. It's really interesting. And I guess uh, that was it. Thank you very much. <laughs> I guess we'll have time for questions. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I have a question about uh, the loading of ELF binaries onto Hexagon. Oh, uh, fast FC shell? That's Is right. You? Okay. So ELF parsers have been known to be uh, rather buggy. Uh, did you get a sense for what sort of ELF parser is there? Is it truly ELF or is it some sort of a, a minimized version of it? And could this parser be exploitable? And what would that give you? Yeah, I didn't really look into that. Um, there is a specification uh, from Qualcomm about the, the ELF, uh, specific ELF version that they use. From my understanding, it's, it's pretty much typical ELF binary, uh, like, uh, like uh, segments and, uh, and all that stuff. Uh, I haven't really looked into that. Uh, that's also very interesting. In particular, uh, relocations, uh, essentially you're getting uh, potentially uh, a patcher. <laughs> yeah, uh, I haven't looked, looked into that, but that's very interesting, yeah. Oh, uh, thank you. Any other questions?
Okay, that's it. Thank you.